Hello and welcome back to Automotive Logistics and Supply Chain Europe Live with me, Christopher Ludwig. The rise of electric vehicle sales and production have sent a high voltage charge throughout the European automotive supply chain. Over the past year of COVID-related disruptions and falling sales, plug-in hybrid and battery electric vehicles have taken off like, not, like, like never before with production and planned output of PHEVs and EVs um, among virtually all OEMs across Europe. And in many ways, the linchpin of electrification is a lithium iron battery supply chain, both as a technological driver of change, as well as helping to make EVs cost competitive compared to ICEs. The headline is, for the, is that the battery supply chain has been and will remain um, very, very based in Asia up to now with a complex set of materials and upstream, upstream suppliers from, from global locations. Europe has up to now has up to now lagged um, certainly Asia, um, but the ramp up is well underway with many battery gigafactories under construction and in the pipeline. Uh, while OEMs and tier suppliers are, are rushing to form strategic partnerships with battery suppliers and indeed investing in new capabilities, and with it, Europe's battery capacity is set to soar, and we'll see plenty of opportunities in production and logistics to go with it as well as challenges. Here to discuss the European battery to supply chain in some depth uh, is Daniel Harrison. He's automotive analyst right here at uh, Ultima Media and Automotive Logistics, working closely with me. And Daniel has really over the past year focused a lot on the battery supply chain. He's got some fantastic insight and data that he's going to share with all of you today, this morning, and will join me afterwards for some Q&A. Daniel, great to have you with us. Thanks, Chris. It's great to be here. Excellent. I'm going to hand over to you now, Daniel, and uh, we'll pick up on some questions afterwards. Let me just remind the audience to put through any questions in the chat along the way. Um, we'll, be, we'll be ready uh, in the background to answer anything that we can and follow up with you afterwards as well. Thanks, Daniel. Okay, thank you, Chris. So European automotive battery supply chain, it's, it's gaining so much attention. The question is, why is it gaining that attention? Uh, why is it so important? Well, the electrification of the EU vehicle fleet will require such a massive expansion of battery cell production. And this is potentially going to completely redraw the map for the auto European automotive supply chain, because essentially what's going to happen is you're going to replace the legacy ICE supply chain with a completely new supply chain of new companies, new structures, new technologies. So just to give you a sense of the scale of this, this seismic shift, uh, let's assume 50% of e EU sales are EVs in 2030. Um, this creates a supply chain worth around 50 billion euros a year. Not surprisingly, this is getting a lot of interest from, from industry, investors, new entrants, and also governments alike, because they want to capture this, this economic uh, a miracle essentially for for their countries now supply chain localization is vital for the economic prosperity of those countries but also to mitigate against disruption uh, especially in the context of uh, recent events with covid um, which has contributed to shortages and disruptions within the supply chain especially for evs and, and ramping up that that demand so this once in a century shift matters hugely for supply chain players and logistics providers. Now let's put this in context. European electrification compares uh, very favorably. In fact, we're, Europe is, is leading the push to electrification globally, especially over the past year. The, the penetration rate has jumped from 3% of sales to over 10.5%. You compare that with the global average of around 4.2%. And there's a number of reasons for that, that much higher penetration rate, and we'll come onto those in a moment. Um, firstly, the, the emissions targets that are being phased in uh, for 2020 for the best 95% of vehicles, and, and this will be fully applied during 2021. And that's a very tough target for, for OEMs to, to meet. And because of that, OEMs have increased significantly the number of electric vehicles and plug-in electric vehicles available on the market and most of course most countries already incentivize evs and phevs through subsidies taxation low emission zones etc but of course further stimulus packages occurred post-covid linked 
mainly to lower emissions vehicles, which were, you know, encouraged by by states at an EU level. So most European countries are also planning to, to ban sales of internal combustion engine vehicles from 2030 to 2035. Now, that, let's remember, that's only two product cycles away. So this is, you know, very, very imminent. The key point here is that this strong regulatory push will make EVs and battery demand almost a certainty. Um, there are also some, some geographic and cultural differences for Europe. The shorter, relatively shorter distance make EV range and the, the accompanying range anxiety less of an issue. And the charging infrastructure uh, is more developed, especially in the Netherlands, Germany, France, UK and Norway. And the population is mostly city-based, which makes EVs more suitable. And historically, fuel prices have been taxed more heavily, which makes the relative cost of running an, an ICE internal combustion engine vehicle versus an EV more favorable for EVs, which are much cheaper to run. So the European Union aims to capture the battery supply chain. And there's a number of strategic and economic reasons for that. Let, let's remember that the, the EV battery can be as much as 30 to 40% of the value of the vehicle. And currently most of that is imported from, from Asia. So if the EU does nothing, the EU, uh, the, the Asia will, will benefit hugely from that and EU will miss that, that slice of the pie of the automotive industry. But of course, Europe cannot compete directly on price with lower cost Asian imports. So the European Commission has, has developed a number of strategies to, to boost the European battery supply chain. So they've given 2.9 billion in subsidies, uh, which is in addition to 3.2 billion that, that gave in two, 2019. But what they've also done is much more significant, which is to announced the Sustainable Batteries Regulation, which uh, the European Commission announced in December 2020. And this is a mandatory requirement on the part of part of the European Green Deal initiative, which means that from July 2024, cathodes, anodes and chemicals must be sourced from within the EU and batteries must have a carbon footprint declaration to be placed within the European market. So from 2027, the target's even tougher. Uh, that requires 100% of the battery components uh, and raw materials to be sourced from the EU, effectively forcing localization of that battery supply chain to Europe. So let's put the, the lithium battery supply chain in the global context. So global battery production um, capacity is currently around 450 gigawatt hours globally. And we forecast that to grow around sevenfold to over 2,800 gigawatt hours by 2030. Now, um, as, as many people have observed, Asia Pacific currently dominates that, that picture with around 77% of global capacity. But European capacity is currently around 60 gigawatt hours, around 13%. But we forecast that to grow to around 950 gigawatt hours in 2030, growing in relative market share to 33%. So Europe of all of the regions will actually experience the fastest of the, the, the growth around the world, expanding by around 16 times by 2030. Now let's look individually at each of the, the, the main elements in supply chain. So we'll start upstream with the raw materials, the, the mining. Now, the issue here is that the vast majority of these elements are from outside of Europe. So for example, lithium is mostly from South America, mostly Chile, Australia, etc. Cobalt is overwhelmingly from the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And we do actually have two European refineries um, producing the, the refined materials within Europe from Umicore and Glencore. Manganese is mainly from South Africa um, and nickel is mainly from Australia, Canada, Russia and Indonesia. Um, and again, with nickel, we have three European refineries with non-nickel, Glencore and Aramat. But crucially, there are no actual mines within Europe extracting this raw material. And therefore, almost none of this supply chain comes from Europe. So this is a major issue and challenge. Uh, 
for the European supply chain. Moving further downstream slightly to the battery components. So this is the cathodes, the anodes, electrolytes, and separators. Um, now let's remember that the sustainable batteries regulation that the EU is introducing requires the sourcing of these cathodes and anodes by 2024. So this is a very tight deadline. We're just talking about three years or so from now. And currently there is very little of that. So in terms of cathodes, almost all comes currently from China and Japan. There are a few plants, for example, BASF uh, has a production facility in Finland. Tesla is planning in its new Berlin plant to have some cathode production. And Johnson Methe is building a new cathode materials plant in Poland. In terms of anodes, almost entirely again from China and Japan, likewise with electrolytes, almost exclusively produced from China and Japan. And separators, again, almost entirely China and Japan with a few US and German players. But nonetheless, again, Asia dominates this part of the supply chain almost more than any other. Um, so battery components is going to be a major challenging in building Europeans localized supply chain. So in terms of the actual battery cell plants, uh, just 11 of the world's 118 battery cell manufacturing plants are in Europe. And this accounts to capacity of around 60 gigawatt hours or 13% of global battery cell production. Now it's LG Energy Solutions Rocklow Poland plant, which dominates with capacity of 75% uh, percent of European capacity, which is 45 gigawatt hours. So that's very dominant. Apart from that, there's relatively small number of, of smaller plants in Europe. So there needs to be a massive expansion to, to meet demand there. So as you can see from the map, uh, the, again, LG's uh, Rocklow Poland plant dominates the, the, the landscape. And you can see a conglomeration there of plants around um, Germany, Poland, Austria, Hungary. It seems to be the main focus. And we'll come on to that in, in, in the questions and answers. Uh, but fundamentally, Europe needs much more gigafactories, around 16 times the, the quantity in terms of capacity by 2030. There are, of course, around 32 battery plants currently being planned or under construction. And most recently at VW's Power Day, they announced plans for a total of six plants with a total capacity of 240 gigawatt hours by 2030. Um, by, and then that pretty much confirms our forecast of an overall picture for Europe of around 950 gigawatt hours by 2030. But it also demonstrates how OEMs are taking increasing ownership of the battery supply chain. Now, the next step in the supply chain is, is often overlooked, which is the, the, the battery pack assembly plants or the battery integration process. So this is where you combine the raw cells, a bit like the AA batteries, that, that everyone knows as consumer batteries into the modules and the packs that are then added to the battery management system, the BMS and the thermal systems, which control the temperature of the battery and the, the battery pack and the casing itself, which makes it safe and secure. And most of these battery plants are intentionally placed quite close to the vehicle assembly lines. Apart from weight reasons, it's very heavy and difficult to ship these batteries over long distances, but also more crucially to allow OEMs to keep a tighter control of this stage of the supply chain. OEMs can actually achieve a significant competitive advantage from this part of the process because this is the, the, where the value add comes on. If you take a raw cell, the way that you pack that together, the type of battery management system software, the thermal systems you use to cool it can have a significant effect on the, the performance of that complete battery pack. And this often, this process of battery pack assembly is often con conducted as joint ventures so that OEMs can also leverage the expertise of the cell suppliers in that process. The next stage, of course, is the OEM EV assembly plants themselves, um, where the battery is integrated with the vehicle. And the, currently there's around 59 European plants that we're aware of producing pure EVs. Um, 
but of course we're expecting a, a significant ramp up in in EV volumes, particularly with Tesla in with its new plant in Berlin, and VW primarily with the ID3 and the ID4 SUV that's coming out soon. And of course, OEM assembly plants are generally located um, close to the battery supply chain, and that's that's a crucial aspect to understand too. The, the final step in the chain is often overlooked in terms of recycling, reusing, repurposing batteries because at the end of their life that they don't just go into landfill they can be used for static storage application load leveling uh, for utilities etc and this closed loop concept is increasingly important as uh, the first generation of ev batteries um, start to to come out of service but it's a very highly fragmented industry unsurprisingly china again dominates this part of the supply chain with other two thirds of capacity, South Korea about one sixth of it. However, there are a few plants within the EU, but crucially again, the EU has regulated that all industrial and automotive battery must be collected and recycled by 2030. So what this all means is that this once in a century transition to electrification will form a new ecosystem of suppliers and this creates many opportunities for new collaborations, partnerships, joint ventures, alliance, etc. Of course, the major suppliers such as LG, CATL, Panasonic and SK Innovation will, will dominate. But nonetheless, the, the niches for smaller startups, for example, AMTE Power specializes in higher power applications for high performance vehicles, for example. They can't compete on volume or price with the big players like LG and Panasonic. But for niche applications, they can tailor the, the chemistry of the battery and the way the pack is put together to, to optimize it for those specific applications. And leading OEMs are trying to capture and control much more of the value chain. For example, it's noted that VW recently announced it's gonna buy out it's 50-50 it's share, I think, of a planned joint venture plant in Germany. Tesla is also stating that it's developing its own cells in-house in a complementary way to its other agreements with Panasonic and CATL and LG Chem in, in Asia. And their new Berlin plant will also have some cathode production and there are also potential moves upstream into lithium extraction itself. So the battery supply chain is essentially uh, where there's a huge competitive advantage to be had. Um, it creates enormous opportunities. For example, we've seen recently a supply shortage of batteries pre and post COVID, which has created longer waiting times for EVs in particular. The tripling of EV and PHEV sales in Europe over the past year clearly required a very strong, flexible, an adaptable supply chain to capitalize on that that increase in demand and we saw ongoing supply chain disruption of course not just in batteries but semiconductors container shipping and and raw materials as well so this highlights the key importance of supply chain localization in that context of disruption of course many, many uh, investments are being made into gigafactories across europe although much more needs to be uh, developed as we've stated, but it's very much the upstream, the raw materials of, of lithium, manganese, nickel, cobalt, etc., but also the battery component parts of the supply chain, which remain the real challenge for developing the European battery supply chain. Thank you very much. So I'll hand you back to, to Chris. Thank you. Thanks very much, Daniel. And uh, you know how much I, uh, I I enjoy talking about the battery supply chain with you, um, filling much of our days and our focus and stuff. But uh, that 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 was another great great overview and insight of all that's going on, uh, you know, with the global context and clearly some of the opportunities and challenges ahead uh, for, for OEM suppliers and battery makers here in Europe. Let's start with that upstream challenge that you you highlighted, you know, how feasible is it really that, that European manufacturers and suppliers um, could localize more of the upstream, the anodes, cathodes, et cetera, um, from a cost and scale point of view? Yeah, that, that's going to be a huge challenge. Um, if we start upstream with the, the raw materials, the lithium, the cobalt, nickel, manganese, etc., 
the, 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 the key challenge there is that Europe doesn't really fundamentally have uh, those resources on its land mass. So that part of the supply chain is largely still going to have to be imported from those countries, mainly Asia, but also South America and, and other regions. Uh, if we go down to the sort of the, the battery components, so the cathodes, the anodes, the separators, the electrolytes, that's more feasible uh, to, to localize in Europe. Um, and there are some moves to do that as I identified uh, in, in the presentation. Um, you know, Tesla's partly doing it, BASF as well are starting to move in that. But it's at a very low level compared to the demand that's, that's required. It's also very specialized, um, those sort of operations to, to produce cathodes and, and anodes. And it takes a lot of experience. So to, to meet the demand or rather the, the, the expectation that the EU has to have complete sourcing of those upstream parts of the supply chain by 2024 is a very tall order. And, and I think it's widely regarded in industry that that's gonna be impossible to meet in such a short timeline. So, so there's obviously the, the <clears throat> arguable geopolitical, geoeconomic factors which are, which are playing a role in there, but to what extent from a sort of, you know, total business cost point of view, how important will will that will some element of that regionalization be, depending on how deep we're talking here, be to bringing down the cost of, of batteries and therefore making, you know, making sure that EVs continue to compete or compete more on, on total cost of ownership, you know, through the through the supply chain and value chain. Yes, the, the cost is is uh, critically uh, linked with localizing of supply chain. We know, for example, that um, a major part of the battery cost is shipping it from, from Asia, all of the logistical complications in doing that, uh, the supply chain disruption. But from a cost perspective, what I see happening is, you know, typically battery prices are sort of in the, around $150 to $180 per kilowatt hour currently. And we're, we're hoping to move down to the sort of the, the, the tipping point where it's hundred dollars per kilowatt hour. And as that cost goes down, the shipping cost becomes more prohibitive for that battery. Therefore it makes more sense to localize it as that cost comes down. Um, so I think that's, that's a major issue that's going to happen. Um, and of course, to, to bring the cost of batteries down, you need huge economies of scale, not lots of small plants, but perhaps fewer very large gigafactories such as LG Chems or LG Energy Solutions plant in uh, Poland is a good example of that. Um, so that to me is is the, the key here, the economies of scale localization to bring down the battery price to a level that will make EVs more widespread and affordable for consumers. That's an interesting point on the scale side, because of course what we see right now is um, Again, when we look at the pipeline, and, and your research brings out a lot of that, <clears throat> quite a mix. Obviously, there's the established players, LG Energy, LG Energy Solutions, SKI, uh, CATL, etc., investing and, and bringing production to Europe. Carmakers like Volkswagen and Tesla, but then a long tail, if you like, of startups, new players, emerging players, and other others from China as well that maybe are new to. Who stands to sort of win this race from your point of view? I mean, is there is there room in the battery pie to go around for all, so to speak, or do you think it will be more of somewhat more of a winner take all scenario? That's a really good question. I think, in in essence, what's going to happen is is a is, is a technological race here because batteries are not commoditized, and that's a key point to understand because. You know, a battery from, from LG or a battery from CATL or Panasonic is not the same as a battery from a startup. So the, the, these ambitious startup plants, um, you know, for example, British Volt uh, or Ital Volt or North Volt are relatively new players in, in, in the field. That's all great and the ambition is great. The issue is going to be, can they produce cells with the same cost performance ratio as CATL or Panasonic and LG who have been in the game for much longer. My feeling is some of those plants will succeed and yes, there, there's certainly a big enough pie for everyone to, to succeed, but some of it might be scaled back because the bigger players will probably 
have more technological breakthroughs to gain advantage. So it will come down to a situation where OEMs are saying, okay, who do we want to supply us? Who's gonna give us the best range, the best charging time, the best performance? And some of those startups may not be able to compete on a, on a level playing field in that sense. They may be able to supply a, 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 you know, at low levels to smaller volumes perhaps. But if you're looking at you know the big big OEMs like VW and Stellantis, they're going to want to be sourced from the best batteries they can possibly get. So it's going to be those big supplies. That might not always be the case. We might have a technological breakthrough from one of the new startups, uh, and that could happen. But my my inclination is that the main players will dominate for many years to come. What do you think is going on there with the, the the vertical integration that we're seeing? And of course, we're seeing that at many levels of the battery supply chain, not not just from OEMs, but but you gave some obviously the examples of Volkswagen. What we've seen at the Power Day recently, clearly Tesla is sending those signals globally in many of their production going further upstream. In an industry, or let's say a sector with EVs, which is so capital intensive and therefore and effectively such a so risk, why why are the OEMs now some OEMs at least? putting yet more capital into, into this part of the supply chain. Mm. Yes, I mean, this is essentially, again, a, a technical technological question. They're trying to gain technological advantage over their competitors. So, for example, with VW and Tesla, they, they're wanting to capture more of the upstream supply chain so that they, in part because they want to capture the, the economic value. That's a hugely valuable part of the pie. Um, you know, Tesla doesn't want to import batteries from, from Panasonic and LG Chem all the time when that's 40% of the value of the vehicle, when they could be partly capturing that supply chain themselves. But the, the key point here is by gaining more control over the supply chain, getting more involved in the technology, the R&D, the development of batteries, they can gain competitive advantage. And we see that with Tesla. They want to uh, actually getting heavily involved in the cathode production and even the lithium mining so that they, they can develop a battery which is slightly better than their competitors and therefore consumers will ultimately see that in the specification and buy those those vehicles and that's ultimately i think what this is about absolutely yeah I mean, you highlighted the regulations that we're seeing in the european um from the european union and some member states um, i think you also made some reference to some to some uh, some public funds some investment coming and we see that not just in the EU, but also in the UK um, and, and other, other parts of Europe at, at various levels. How important will the will, will state money in effect, will the public investment be in developing this, this supply chain in Europe? Um, not least given you know, state aid rules in, this, in the single market that, that might limit you know, just how much some, could, some, some investment could be, how high it could be. Yeah, so that's a great point and, and hotly debated. Um, we know that the European Union has provided, I think, a, a, over 6 billion euros in, in recent funding to support the European battery supply chain. And uh, yet at the same time, there are quite strict rules on, on state aid for, you know, giving a, an unfair advantage to a particular company or set of companies over another. And we know, for example, that LG with its Rocklow Poland plant is currently being investigated for state aid that it, it received towards that plant. So this is a very um, uh, difficult area because on the one hand, European Union desperately wants to capture this, the battery supply chain and, and give um, you know help and support to, to developing those those private companies ultimately to to develop the supply chain. But on the other hand, it's 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 his hands are tied in terms of state aid. So what seems to be happening is that this kind of state aid is being allowed because it's for the common good, a high good. You know, the, the capturing of this supply chain is so strategically important, so economically important that they're, they're allowing this. But this case, ongoing case with LG in Poland is interesting to watch. But I think for now, we're going to see uh, continued state aid to support that overarching aim of, of developing the European battery supply chain. Indeed. So, Daniel, maybe we're running low on time, but I have room for probably, I think, one more question, at least here. Um, a bit earlier, you just mentioned battery supply chain. Batteries uh, are a competitive advantage and therefore 
sort of this is the supply chain. Um, do you expect that to remain the case as OEMs electrify more widely, um, as in effect the technology perhaps the barriers to entry lower to some extent? Um, it, is it is it competitive for now, or or is it likely to remain a hot hotly competitive issue? You know, well into the next stages of electrification. I, I think it will remain. Uh, a competitive advantage for a considerable time, primarily because batteries are not commoditized. There are differences in performance, in characteristics, in range, in charging time, for example. And, you know, as, as the technological arms race continues and, and volumes are ramped up, the, the ability of that supply chain to meet that demand, to meet that technological development and growth in, in the performance of, of batteries Will remain central. Um, I, th I think in, in the medium to longer term, I don't see batteries becoming commoditized yet. There's, there's always going to be new technology just around the corner, whether it's lithium sulfur, whether it's even solid state batteries. Um, so that, that, that arms race will continue and that competitive advantage of a flexible, um, adaptable supply chain that can respond to disruption that can respond to surges in demand such as we've seen in the year of the last year where sales have tripled that will always remain critical so that that supply chain resilience that 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 flexibility will always remain key for me that's a great 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 point to end there and also i think for our audience too to note as well the, the role that logistics and supply chain management clearly will play in that too and facilitating exactly that flexibility helping to attain that scale and, and, and ultimately reduce costs and keep, you know, keep the products moving. So Daniel, thank you so much for sharing this data and insight. Uh, I, I will plug that um, the, the battery research that Daniel's working on will, will, be more, will be available more widely on the automotive logistics site uh, in May. Uh, so we'll have more on that from you more on that when it's ready for release. Uh, in the meantime, those of you who have passed questions through, uh, as mentioned, we'll be answering them in the chat, but we'll also follow up and happy to, to connect further with Daniel and our team uh, on, on more issues on battery. And of course, across this conference where we have so much discussion of the electric vehicle and battery supply chain. So stick with us. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks again, Daniel. Thanks everyone. See you soon.